to one and all welcome to today's uh, webinar on a comparative analysis of the doctrine of fair use and fair dealing which will be conducted by our guest speaker viber hora a brief introduction of mr viber hora he comes from the city sholapur he is from the same college where i have graduated ILS Law College, Pune. Subsequent to his completion of law, he went to pursue his LLM in the United States of America. There, he had worked as a law associate in the top tier law firms like K and L Gates, Diaco. Uh, our guest speaker's expertise is in international intellectual property law, trademark. Code for management, patent and trademark prosecution, as well as international trade law. With this background, I would like to yield the floor to our uh, speaker, Mr. Vaipavora, for his address. Thank you, Manav, uh, for the introduction. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, I will. I welcome you all to this webinar for uh, today evening. uh and uh, first of all i'd like to thank manav and uh, thomas george and associates for giving me this opportunity uh to share the information that i've gained uh with you guys uh it's a privilege to be doing this uh, amidst the ongoing pandemic of uh, covid so uh the topic for today is the doctrine of fair use and uh, fair dealing under copyright law and uh, we are uh going to do a comparison of the doctrine of fair use in the us and the doctrine of fair dealing in india so uh we all have been seeing a lot of parody videos that are being posted on uh, youtube and facebook these days uh, and a lot of uh, memes that are posted on insta uh, where one person is uh, commenting and critiquing on other person's work and also uh, you might have seen a spoof of a video that has been posted online so ordinarily these acts would amount to copyright infringement that is because uh, copyright gives the owner an exclusive right to prevent a third person uh, from infringing upon his work however uh, under the copyright regime uh, there is an exception to such kind of an infringement uh, which means that uh, a third person or a random person can use some part of a copyrighted work Uh, without being liable for infringement so that exception is called as the uh, defense of uh, or the doctrine of fair use uh, so uh, i like to start with uh, uh, can you please change the slide uh, manav right so uh, let us begin with uh, what is fair use so in the most general sense uh, the term fair use means the act of copying a copyrighted material for a very limited and transformative purpose so what uh, fair use tries to say is that uh, certain acts of copying shall not amount to copyright infringement if they are used for the purposes of commenting uh, criticizing researching etc etc so uh, some of the examples of uh, uh, fair use would be where you are quoting quoting an excerpt from a book in your own article uh just to review or uh, to you know to criticize or comment it or uh, when you make a parody of somebody else's work just to mock that person or uh, when you use sound clips and uh, video clips in your own work uh, or in your own uh, presentations uh, for the purposes of teaching and reporting uh, 
so uh, a real life example would be uh, those images of donald trump that are used to make cartoons uh, just to mock him so all these acts would technically uh, fall within the purview of uh, the doctrine of fair use now uh, what is its origin how did the law come into existence so surprisingly uh, the doctrine of fair use is uh, is a 100 year old law uh, it was first introduced in the case of giles versus wilcox uh, in 1740 uh, where the court of chancery established uh, the term fair abridgement and said that unauthorized abridgement of copyrighted works shall be permitted to some some extent so uh, what they tried to say is that uh, unauthorized copying of copyrighted work shall be permitted to some extent that that's what they were trying to say that you can copy some amount of work from a copyrighted work and that would not be copyright infringement so that doctrine of uh, fair abridgement is what later developed uh, into uh, the doctrine of fair use and fair dealing so uh, what was the policy behind uh enacting such a law why did they bring fair use into existence so the main policy the main intention was to create an economic equilibrium so what they said that they wanted to promote the progress of creativity as well as protect uh, the copyright owner's interest so what they said that uh, the general public should also benefit uh, from the copyrighted work of a person as well as there should be a layer of protection Uh, for these, uh, for the co- for the copyright owner, so that was uh, their intention to maintain a balance between uh, the interests of the public and the interests of the copyright owner. Uh, Manav, next slide. So, uh, what are some of the purposes that fall under the fair use doctrine? So, if you use a copyrighted work for the purposes of teaching or research or news reporting or one of those uh, purposes that are mentioned in this list. Uh, then you can uh, qualify for the defense of fair use however uh, if you use a copyrighted uh, material uh, for the purposes of making money out of it or for a commercial purpose or uh, you or you use it in a bad faith just to defame the copyright owner or uh, where you don't give credits to the uh, real author then you shall not qualify for the defense of fair use next slide so uh, what is the position of uh, fair use under the us copyright law the term uh, the section 107 of the us copyright act uh, mentions uh, the term fair use and says that uh, some acts of copying shall not amount to copyright infringement if they are used for the purposes such as criticism comment news reporting uh, teaching scholarship or research now uh, for this section i would like to bring your sorry right uh, so for this section i would like to bring your attention uh, to the words such as that that's mentioned in the section so the reason uh, only reason the word such as uh, were mentioned because the law makers did not want to restrict the list of purposes that would constitute fair use so they what they intended was that there could be purposes other than the one that are mentioned in section 107 that would amount to fair use so uh, section 107 has always been considered to be very broad uh, and open ended uh, because uh, they they have not kept it restrictive and exhaustive so they have always said that uh, there could be other purposes that would uh, amount to fair use and uh, whenever a case of fair use comes to the us court they always apply section 107 on a case by case basis because the fair use doctrine is a open ended doctrine and it's a very broad uh, broad and interpretative doctrine they always evaluate the case on a on the basis of facts and circumstances so that's why uh, it's always uh, in, uh, the us courts have always considered the fair use to be a very uh, broad doctrine and all uh, also section 107 is uh, applicable to all kinds of copyrighted work so basically the defense of fair use can be claimed for any kind of copyrighted work uh, next slide so uh, initially the term fair use was first used in the us statute in 18 in 1869 uh, 
uh, in a case called as Lawrence versus Dina. However, uh, the concept was initiated in 1841 in another case called as Folsom versus Marsh, uh, which is a very landmark and famous judgment um, in the US copyright law, uh, where Justice Tory, uh, the judge, uh, he, he enumerated four factors uh, that could be used to determine if a use is a fair use or not. So those factors are mentioned here. So whenever a case of fair use comes in, uh, the judge or the courts, they always uh, examine these four factors before giving a judgment. So the first factor is the purpose and character of your use. So whenever you are claiming the defense of fair use, the court is going to look whether uh, look at the purpose of your copy. So the court uh, determines whether your use is uh, commercial or non-profit and also if the use is transformative. Uh, this particular factor is also known as the transformative factor. Um, I'll, I'll explain why it's called transformative factor uh, in a bit. So uh, the main reason for considering this factor is the court will always look if you are trying to make money out of this factor or not. So if you are using it for a commercial purpose, the court is not going to uh, give you the defense of uh, fair use. Uh, coming to the transformative purpose, uh, for this particular factor, the court examines if you have used the original work to create something new out of it. So uh, say, the, for example, uh, if an artist were to take a portion of another artist's copyrighted image and he uses that same portion in his own image, uh, just to make a commentary on it, that would amount to transformative purpose. So uh, basically the court always looks that if you have created something new out of the original work. And uh, while determining this factor, uh, the court always asks two important questions. Whether has the material that has been taken from the original work been transformed into something new? And uh, was value added to the original work by putting some kind of a new aesthetics, mm -hmm. new insights or something like that, which makes it into a new work. So these two questions are always asked by the court when they are uh, determining the purpose and character of your work. The second is the nature of the work. So the court shall also consider the nature of the uh, work that has been copied, uh, whether the work has be, is a factual work or a fictional work. Uh, usually if the copying is done from a fictional work, then the defense of fair use is not awarded. Uh, it's only awarded when the copying has been done from a factual work. In addition, uh, the court will also consider whether the work is published or unpublished work. Whenever the work is published, uh, that means the work is already in the market. So when you are copying from a published work, then the, uh, then the defense of fair use is applicable. However, when the uh, work is unpublished, uh, then there is a there are the, the chances are very less that they will uh, award you the defense of fair use because the right to control the first public appearance is with the uh, is, is with the owner of the copyright. So say uh, you are copying a song from a movie uh, that is not released, then the defense of fair use shall not be applicable to. The third important factor is the amount and substantiality of the work that has been taken. So whenever you copy a uh, copyrighted work, the court is going to consider the amount, the proportion of the work that has been copied. So uh, they will look at the quantity of the work that you are uh, that you have copied from the original work. Say you have copied around 30, 40 or 50 percent of the work, then the defense of fair use shall not be awarded. Uh, because the logic is the less of the work you copy, the more are the chances that you can claim fair use. However, if you claim a lot of, uh, if you copy a lot of the work, then uh, there's a high chance that uh, the courts are not going to take it as a fair use. Apart from looking at the quantity of the work, the courts also look at the quality of the work that has been taken. So in this particular factor, uh, say if you have copied one of one, uh, some other people's work, the court is going to look at the quality of the work that has been taken. Uh, for example, uh, there was a Charlie Chaplin video, uh, which was a total of 72 minutes. And one another person, we copied only one minute and 15 seconds of the video. 
now that is actually a very trivial copying however the court said that the the quality that was copied was actually the heart of the work so that that means that the crux of the entire work was copied in those 1 minute and 15 seconds and therefore the court said that uh, the use was not fair because uh, you actually the, that that person actually took away the uh, main uh, heart of the work so this is like you are uh, copying the climax of a movie so that because the climax is climax is the most important part of a movie if you copy that part itself then it shall not amount to failure the fourth factor is the effect of of uh, the use upon the potential market this is the most important factor while determining fair use now this factor is also called as the market harm test so when a person copyrights his work his intention is to gain a monopoly on that work and to make money out of it so what the us courts say that if the copying of your work hampers the monetary value of the original work or undermines the potential market of the copyright owner then your use shall not be a uh, fair use uh, that is the reason a lot of uh, cases when they come to the us courts uh, the court always gives a lot of weightage to this factor they'll always see if this factor uh, if the if this if the copying of the work is uh, hampering the val- the monetary value of the copyright owner so that this this factor has been uh, considered to be one of the most important factor uh, in the fair use doctrine so uh, let's take a look at uh, what is the position of uh, fair use uh, in international law man of any change right yeah so uh, the doctrine of fair use has been incorporated into most of the international laws so as you can see article 9 of the bern convention and article 13 of the trips agreement they state that member nations shall provide an exception or a limitation to the exclusive right of a copyright owner so they uh, all the members shall have a exception mentioned in their copyright legislation against the exclusive right of a copyright owner apart from uh, article 9 and article 13 of the trips article 10 of the wipo copyright treaty also mentions that member nations shall provide an exception to the exclusive right of a copyright uh, owner so uh, all these uh, international uh, laws they say that uh, the member nations are supposed to have an exception a mandatory exception to the exclusivity of the copyright uh, that the owner gets under its copyright law now uh, fair use doctrine is considered to be the most fairest of all doctrines because it has been crafted keeping the trips agreement and the bern convention in mind so fair use doctrine is the most um, uh, you know most in compliance with the trips agreement so it has been considered to be the most fairest of doctrines and all other countries have usually crafted they are uh, uh, they are fair use defenses uh, on the basis of fair use doctrine uh in my next slide so uh, what are some landmark cases on fair use the first one is called uh, libovitz versus paramount corp uh, as you can see the photo on the right uh, is of actress demi moore uh, so there was a actress demi moore she had a photo shoot when she was 8 months pregnant back in 1993 so what paramount did is uh, they photo edited the same photo they used her photo and uh, replaced it with the face of another actor called as leslie nelson Uh, to promote their movie called as naked gun that was supposed to release in 1994 so uh, a suit of copyright infringement was brought against them however the court held that this was a pure case of parody just like i said um, a lot of people they use uh, images of donald trump to create those kind of uh, meme photos so just to mock him so this was similar to that and the court also had that uh, held that the use of demi moore's photo did not harm the potential uh, potential markets of demi moore so they took the fourth factor into consideration and said that the use of the photo was not undermining the monetary value of demi moore so that's why they they said that this is a pure case of uh, parody 
and uh, they they allowed they awarded the uh, defense of fair use to paramount the second important case is the case of sony corporation of america versus universal uh, city studios so this case is also known as the betamax case back in the 1990s uh, sony had developed vcr uh, as you guys might know vcr the visual cassette recorders so uh, what a lot of people did that time was uh, they used the sony vcr to record uh, shows that were broadcasted on the television now these shows they belong to universal city studios and uh, just like we do it on our set top box these days we record the shows that we like so that we can watch it later so a lot of people were doing the same thing back then in 1990s so when universal city came to know about this they brought a case of infringement against sony now what the court held is that all of these people who were recording uh, the the shows using the vcr they were doing it for their own private purpose so they said they they applied the first uh, factor saying that the purpose was completely non commercial they were not making any money out of it and they were only doing it because they wanted to maybe watch it at a later time so the purpose and use were completely non commercial so that's why the court held that there was no case of uh, copyright infringement and uh, they allowed the defense of fair use another very important case is the case of lens versus universal music corp so uh, there was one lady called as stephanie lens uh, and she had a kid so one day her kid was dancing and she recorded that video and she put it on youtube now the total length of the video was 29 seconds out of which the first 9 seconds there is a music that is played in the background that music was a song called as let's go crazy which was owned by universal music so a suit of in again a suit of copyright infringement was brought against stephanie lens now apart from the four factors that have been mentioned in folsom versus marsh there is one fifth factor which is called as the defense of de minimis so what does de minimis mean de minimis means trivial so whenever the copying is of a very trivial scale so whenever you uh, the copying is of a very small amount uh, the court is not going to consider the fair use analysis altogether so say if you are copying only 30 seconds of a 3 hour movie the court is going to consider that the use is so trivial that they are not going to consider it as any kind of infringement and it is also not going and the courts are also not going to apply uh the four factor test to determine if it's fair use or not because the copying is so trivial so in this particular case also the courts held that the copying was so trivial that it they did not apply the fair use analysis they come they directly said that uh, you know what the copying is very small and this should not amount to any kind of infringement so again in this or in this case also stephanie lens was given uh the the defense of fair use and she was not made liable under any kind of under copyright infringement so uh, all this talks about uh, the doctrine of uh, fair use um, it's, it's it's one of the most liberal doctrines under the us copyright law and uh, because of its broad uh, broader meaning it uh, section 107 has always been applied on a case by case basis So the courts have never always gone by the book. Uh, they have always considered what are the facts and circumstances of the case uh, before they decide if it's a use is fair use or not. So apart, just like the fair use doctrine in the U.S., uh, we have the doctrine of fair dealing in India. So the doctrine of fair dealing, similar to the fair use doctrine, is an exception or limitation to the exclusive right of a copyright owner. uh it means that uh, certain acts shall not be considered uh, to be a uh, copyright infringement uh when they come under the doctrine of fair dealing so how did fair dealing come into existence both of these doctrines fair use and fair dealing have been developed in the english courts so the term 
fair dealing was statutorily introduced in 1914 as a mere duplication of section 2 clause 1 clause i of the uk copyright act uh, which stated that certain acts shall not uh, certain acts of copying shall not constitute copyright infringement if they fall within the purposes of private research study review or newspaper summary so i'll discuss this in brief uh, a little later um, but what was the policy of uh, bringing fair dealing in india again just like the us fair use doctrine their idea was to promote uh, to prevent the stagnation of growth of creativity and at the same time uh, give some kind of uh, protection to the copyright owner so both the the policies are pretty similar they wanted uh, the public to use uh, a little of the copyrighted work uh, as well as at the same time you know uh, give some kind of a, a layer of protection to the copyright owner so that nobody infringes upon his work uh the next case uh, next slide please so what is the position of uh, fair dealing under the indian law so the term fair dealing has not been defined under the indian copyright law in a case called as hubbard versus wasper in 1972 uh, lord denning he said that uh, there uh, it is not possible to define what is fair dealing it is a question of degree and a matter of impression so because there are no set guidelines and the quantum is not provided it is not possible to have a clear and uh, definition of fair dealing section 52 of the indian copyright act deals with certain acts as acts not to acts not to be infringement so it says that certain acts shall not be copyright infringement if they fall uh, within the pur purview of fair dealing so uh, it lays down fair dealing as an affirmative defense to copyright infringement so let's have a look at section 52 uh, in the next slide so section 52 of the indian copyright act lays down the groundwork for fair dealing uh the concept of fair dealing is one of the most least explored areas in the indian intellectual property law as compared to the uh, us or as compared to the western countries the doctrine of fair dealing is still in the development stage it has not completely evolved as much as the fair use doctrine in the us it's still in the nascent stage and is being developed so uh, section 52 says that uh, some acts shall not be considered uh, to be copyright infringement if they fall within the purposes of private personal use including research criticism or review or uh, reporting of current events and affairs so section 52 lays down uh, certain purposes uh, under which an act shall not constitute uh, copyright infringement uh, so it's it's basically as compared to section fair use doctrine uh, as compared to the fair use doctrine uh, if you remember section 107 has the words such as that's because section 107 the law makers did not want to restrict the number of purposes however under section 52 the list of purposes is exhaustive it is very restrictive so if your purpose does not fall within the ones that are mentioned in section 52 then you are not going to be awarded the defense of fair deal also overall section 52 lists down around 40 types of actions which are fair dealing so if supposedly you are copying somebody else's work and your use uh, does not fall within one of the 40 types of actions that are that are mentioned in section 52 then you are not going to uh, be awarded the defense of fair dealing so a very restrictive and a close ended section uh, you uh, usually uh, the uh, in, in in india uh, the whenever a case of fair dealing comes in the court always goes by the books as compared to the us courts they always look at the facts and circumstances of the case in india they will always go by the statute so if the act for if, uh, if the act of copying falls within the purview of what is written in the book only then they are going to award Uh, the defense of fair dealing so let's go to the next uh, slide 
so what are the factors under fair dealing uh, similar to the us uh, uh, fair use doctrine uh, there are certain uh, factors that have been laid down uh, to determine whether a use is fair dealing or not so the first factor is the amount and substantiality of the dealing uh, just like uh, the us fair use doctrine the court is going to look at how much of the work have you copied so if you have copied a lot of the work uh, substantial amount of the work then they are not going to award you the defense of fair dealing uh, the logic is uh, the larger the taking the less fair the dealing so if you take a large amount of the work uh, for your use um, then it's not going to come under the purview of fair dealing secondly they are going to consider the purpose character and commercial nature of the dealing so similar to the transformative factor in the us fair use doctrine they are going to look at the purpose of copying so if you have copied somebody else's work just because um, you wanted to make money out of it then they are not going to uh, they are going to make you liable for copyright infringement and also they are going to see if you have used the original work to transform it into something new so this is similar to the transformative factor uh, that was laid down in Poisson versus Marsh by Justice Day the third factor is the effect of use on the original work now unlike the market harm test uh, the indian courts do not consider the monetary value all they consider is the, is there any likelihood of competition between your copied work and the original work so it's going to see that uh, if you copy somebody else's work what is the impact of uh, your use on the value on the original work so it should not degrade the original work it should not convey the same information as the original work it has to be something new and it should not undermine the value of the uh, owner's uh, original work so that that's a uh, it's a different factor from the market harm factor uh, where they are just going to see if your use is uh, is uh, hampering the value of the uh, copyright owner so these are the three factors that are Uh, mentioned under fair dealing so let's have a look at the landmark cases on fair dealing so uh, the first landmark case is uh, civic chandran versus amini amma this case is exactly similar to falsum versus mars in 1840 that was uh, uh, that happened in 1841 where justice story laid out four factors that determine fair dealing this particular case lays down three factors That that is used to determine uh, if a if a work comes under fair dealing or not. So those three factors are the quantum and value of the matter taken. That is similar to the um, one we saw, the amount and substantiality of the work that is used. The second is the purpose for which it was taken. Then again, similar to the purpose and character of the work that is used. And the third, the likelihood of com competition, which means the the effect of use on the original work. so this particular uh, case uh, lays down the three factor or three tests uh, to determine if the use is fair dealing and it's similar to the case of falsum versus march uh, the second case is uh, the case of the chancellor masters and scholars of university of oxford and others versus rameshwari photocopying services and another also known as the du photocopying case uh, so i remember when i was in law college we had a uh, we had a photocopying shop called as jalaram and uh, what he used to do is uh, he used to give us photocopied notes of all these commentaries like bangia and all of that and uh, this is uh, and and he used to compile notes and then distribute it among the students so this case is similar there was a photocopying shop in the campus of du that's delhi university and uh, he was compiling a lot of books and then photocopying them and distributing it amongst the students now what happened is when the publications came to know about this they filed a case of copyright infringement saying that uh, such an act of you know photocopying should not be allowed because uh, kids are buying photocopied notes and they are not buying our commentary so what the court held is that uh, the purpose of copying and the purpose of distributing it amongst the students was for the uh, for teaching so that they said that uh, distributing photocopied books among students was done solely for the purpose of teaching and private use so the students were not, not making money out of it 
and also that they were using it uh, privately for their own personal use. So the court held that uh, this this photocopy uh, act shall not amount to uh, any kind of copyright infringement, and uh, they awarded the uh, defense of fair dealing. The image uh, which is shown on the right is basically of the person that Rameshwari photocopy services. Ah. So uh, they they said that this is just for teaching and. Uh, It's, there's no commercial use to it, and uh, because it's within the campus of DU, it comes as a subsidiary of the DU, so uh, it comes as an educational institution, and that's why uh, they said that uh, there is no copyright infringement. The third case is of India TV versus Yashraj Films Private Limited. Uh, this case is important in its own way. Uh, the reason is uh, because. Uh, this case is a little different from the cases mentioned above. Uh, India TV was broadcasting uh, a show where they were showing the life of Bollywood singers, uh, what they their life in the 1980s and all of that. And the work was originally owned by Yashraj Films. So when Yashraj came to know about this, they they filed a copyright infringement. For the first time, uh, the courts felt that Section 52 is very restrictive. So they said that although the work of uh, although the copying or the broadcasting of the show was a was an act of fair dealing, uh, it did not fall within the purview of the actions that are mentioned in section 50. So the court uh, felt that you know what uh, uh, the section uh, although this purpose is fair dealing, it's still not mentioned in the book. It's still not uh, incorporated as an act. Under Section 52, and that's why um, this, uh, Section 52 is very, very uh, restrictive and exhaustive. Mm. So uh, the court uh, said that uh, the court took a diversion from the conventional approach, and they said that uh, okay, we are not going to make you liable for infringement because uh, uh, we consider this to be a fair dealing. However, it is not uh, mentioned in the statute, so we have to go by the book. Uh, so you are not going to make be made liable for infringement. However, You cannot broadcast this show without the permission of the copyright owner. So you cannot. You'll have to first consult uh, Yashraj, and then only you will be able to broadcast this show. So uh, this this is a very important uh, judgment because uh, what uh, the courts felt is that there is a lot more to Section 52 uh, other than what has been mentioned in the book. So they also felt that our uh, this uh, the doctrine of fair dealing as mentioned. Uh, in the indian copyright act is very very narrow and uh, very exhaustive so yeah so they took a took a diversion from their original approach and uh, they said that okay we are not going to make you liable for copyright infringement so these three are uh, the important landmark cases on uh, fair dealing in india and uh, here uh, in the next slide yeah so here uh, i have made a comparison of the factors under uh, the fair use doctrine and the factors under the indian fair dealing so uh, as you can see the first factor is the purpose and character which is similar to uh, the fair use and both the fair use and fair dealing has the same factor uh, the second factor also the amount and substantiality of the work uh, both of them have this similar uh, factor for determining if the use is fair use or not uh, the third factor again is similar uh, which is the nature of the copyrighted work or the character of the dealing so uh, the first three factors are same uh, and are, it's, it's common for both of the doctrines so for fair use and fair dealing uh, the factors of purpose amount and nature are similar the only difference is in the fourth factor now the mark uh, in the us fair use doctrine there is the market harm factor whereas in indian fair dealing they have the effect of use on the original work uh in my opinion the market harm factor is one of the most important factor uh, to determine if uh, the use is fair use or not because most of these infringements that happen is only in terms of monetary because they are undermining or undercutting the monetary value of the uh, copyright owner so the market harm factor determines if if uh, if the use or if the copying is hampering the value uh, you know if if it's uh, undercutting the money that is supposed to be earned by the copyright owner 
and in case of our uh, fair dealing they just consider if there is any uh, likelihood of competition or you know if it's conveying the same information but in no it does not consider if there is any um, if, it, if there is any impact on the potential value or uh, market value of the uh, of the copyrighted work so uh, i i think that maybe in the future uh, they might consider this market harm test and you know uh, they should amend the maybe if there is an amendment in the copyright uh, law they should definitely include the market harm factor uh, in the in our in, in, in section 52 in, in the doctrine of fair dealing so that's that's the only difference between uh, the fair dealing and fair use is that uh, the fourth factor is uh, is, is uh, completely different from each other uh, let's go to the next slide so uh, doing a general comparison on fair use and fair dealing uh, is that fair use is considered to be more expansive than fair dealing so as i said section 107 is open to interpretation um, the doctrine is an open ended doctrine there is no uh, exhaustive list you can uh, if, if if your uh, case has such kind of facts and circumstances uh, that they amount to fair use then the court is going to consider them uh, as compared Uh, to fair dealing fair dealing has a limited uh, limited set of purposes uh, they don't have a very broad uh, broad definition to the term and also they have specifically listed down actions uh, which are going to come under fair dealing so uh, if you read section 52 it's a very long section because uh, they have literally mentioned uh, acts that are going to be considered as fair dealing and if you copy somebody else's work and it does not fall within those 40 actions then you are not going to be uh, awarded the defense straight away so it is completely it's a rigid principle uh, they are going completely by the book so it's it's not as expansive as compared to the fair use doctrine secondly fair use doctrine is based on utilitarian principle which means that uh, they are con they, they consider the benefit of the public and the benefit of the author both they want the the public to uh, gain some you know they they want the public to gain some benefit out of the copyrighted work as well as they want the uh, they they are uh, ready to uh, uh, you know give some kind of a protection to the copyright owner so it's it's completely based on a utilitarian principle and uh, whereas uh, the doctrine of fair dealing is based on the natural law theory which means that the author is of supreme value so whenever a case of fair dealing comes in the court they are first going to look uh, if there has been any kind of impact on the uh, on the uh, on the creation of the author they are going to first see if uh, if they if the you copying is causing some kind of a harm or uh, you know uh, some kind of a reputational harm or some kind of monetary harm or anything like that to the uh, author so the the first consideration is whether uh, The, there is any kind of impact on the creation of the author so that is uh, the doctrine is based uh, on the natural law theory uh, whereas uh, fair use doctrine they consider the benefit of the public as well and at the same time they are giving some kind of a protection to uh, the copyright owner uh, apart from uh, also yeah apart from these uh, one major difference is uh, fair use doctrine also considers the quality of the work uh, so if you remember i mentioned about the charlie chaplin video uh, where the video was uh, total for 72 minutes and only 1 minute and 52 seconds or 15 seconds were copied and even then the court said that uh, the use is unfair because the court considered the quality of the work that was taken so uh, fair use doctrine uh, does not just look at the quantity of the work it also looks at the quality of the work that has been taken fair dealing on the other hand uh, considers only the amount and substantiality of the work it's not going to consider uh, whether the crux of the work has been taken uh, or whether the heart uh, the heart of the uh, heart of the work has been taken or like so it's it's not going to consider the quality of the work it is just going to consider uh, the quantity of the work so we are just going to consider if you have uh, how much of the work have you copied and uh, fair use definitely considers uh, if uh, if they have if somebody has taken the heart of the work or you know if they have taken uh, what is the most important part in the video has been copied or not 
so uh, fair use and fair dealing has this one important uh, difference of uh, considering the quality of the work and lastly uh, like i mentioned before uh, fair use considers the market harm test so uh, they always look at how much of um, how much of money is the uh, if is the copyright owner going to lose out of this copying so say if i copy uh, i copy a movie from a song uh, sorry if i copy a song from a movie uh, and uh, and i put it out in the public the court is going to see how much of a monetary harm i'm doing to the owners of the movie so they are always going to first see uh, the monetary value uh, even before considering the remaining three factor that is the purpose uh, the amount and the nature they are going first going to look at how much of uh, uh, impact is happening on the monetary value of the copyrighted work fair dealing uh, does not have that kind of a determining factor they are they usually don't look at the monetary value although there have been some cases where uh, indian courts have started looking at the monetary value as well because um, uh, surprisingly that is the most important factor amongst all of the four factors and a lot of people whose works are infringed they are always concerned about uh their money that they are losing a lot of money because of this cost uh, because of the copying so yeah you know, um, this is a very major difference between um fair use doctrine and fair dealing is that uh, the test of market harm is missing under the fair dealing doctrine so these are some of the comparisons between fair use and fair dealing uh, the concept has evolved a lot in the U us court uh in india the cases are less and that's why uh the doctrine is still evolving it's still growing day by day uh, indian courts are on their way of uh, developing a new uh, or maybe amending the copyright act so that uh, you know they can address the fair dealing uh, in a more broader way so uh, these are some of the comparisons uh, on next slide so uh, what is the importance of fair use and fair dealing in the digital environment now most of the things as you have seen have gone online uh, you see everything in today's world is almost online and most of these infringements are happening online most of the copyright infringements that are happening are happening uh, are happening on the internet so uh, there has been an ongoing debate regarding the applicability of fair use and fair dealing uh with regards to the modern technologies uh because a lot of people are using the defense of fair use uh, to get away from copyright infringement uh, there has been a debate uh, on this particular issue so uh, some of the academic scholars uh, say that uh, the doctrine of fair use should apply as it is in the digital world they say that they should uh, be entitled to the privilege of section 107 and uh, section 52 uh to get away from a, a case of copyright infringement on the other hand uh copyright owners are saying that uh, a lot of their work is being misused and uh, most of this uh, people most of the people who copy such work uh, are getting away uh, claiming the defense of fair use so, so they say that there is a uh, requirement to regulate the these doctrines so that they can address the new technologies so basically uh, it's a it's a it's a, a very interesting debate because uh, there are two sides of the uh, two sides of the coin where one side is saying that you know what fair fair use should be applicable in the digital world uh, the way it is and there is another where copyright in, in uh, the copyright owners uh, they are saying that uh, a lot of our work is been infringed and nobody is doing anything about it because every time we go to the Post the defense of fair use comes into play. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, you might see that uh, a lot of takedown notices are uh, uh, shot on YouTube uh, when somebody feels that their work is infringed. But most of these takedown notices are uh, are failing or are taken away. Uh, it's, not, it's not applicable because uh, the defendants always claim the defense of fair use. So that's why uh, uh, there has been a debate where. Uh, Uh, people have been saying that you know what uh, you should amend uh, the doctrines of fair use and uh, fair dealing so that they can uh, address the 
uh, emerging technologies. So that's it all about uh, fair use and fair dealing. Um, I just have uh, one question for you guys. Uh, so does a reaction video on YouTube attract the defense of fair use? Uh, you must be seeing a lot of uh, reaction videos that are posted online uh, where one channel takes the video of another channel and they just put their reactions on it uh, and they and they post it online and what has happened is these reaction channels uh, these reaction channels they are gaining a lot of uh, viewers and subscribers by using the copyrighted work of somebody else so uh, uh, you might know Kari Minati, uh, he does a lot of uh, roast videos uh, uh, he uses the work of somebody else and you know what he, he puts a reaction and he puts a lot of criticism and comment on it and there are also other channels who you know uh, they, they just give their reaction on a, on, on, a, on a particular video so uh, I know of one channel uh, they always whenever a new trailer of a movie comes in so what they do is they just take that trailer and uh, they just give their reaction to it so they are just going to if it's a nine minute trailer they are going to come take the whole nine minutes and they are going to put their reactions to it so uh, my question is does if if a case of infringement is brought against such reaction channels can they claim the defense of fair use uh, and before you give your answers uh, you should always uh, evaluate any case uh, by the four factors that have been uh, listed in Paulson versus Mark. So you should always consider if the amount and the work and uh, you know the nature of the work and uh, if there is any market harm that is being caused. So you should evaluate on those factors and then consider if a reaction video uh, can claim the defense of fair use. So um, I'd like to know your answers uh, to this. Um, maybe Manav, you can start with uh, what's your opinion on this? We would like to, uh, that as an intern, Kirti, Kirti, would you like to answer, give an answer to the speaker? Hello, sir. Sir, thank you so much for a comprehensive explanation. It was really very insightful. Sir, to answer your question, sir, I think that since it comes under the uh, criticism word used in section 52, it should be covered and also because when you are using a reaction video, then in that reaction itself, we are giving credits to the owner. We are saying that this is the view the video of this owner and we are giving reaction to that. So credits is also given, right? Sometimes they just take the trailer, like they don't even care if credits are given or not. I know of one channel who, who blatantly uses uh, 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 the uh, another person's video and he just gives his... Uh, so, Kari Minati, consider Kari Minati. He, whenever he does a roast video, he does not give any kind of credits to the uh, owner of the video. He just directly roasts that person. So, what do you think should happen in that case? In case no credits are given to the author? I think included in 52. Sorry? But I think since 52 has criticism uh, as a defense, as in if it's used for criticism, it will be included uh, as defense. But he's using the whole of his video, right? So if there is a new uh, new um, picture that is coming and they have a theatrical release on YouTube, uh, there are so many channels that uh, they directly take the whole of the uh, theatrical and they use it to give a reaction. So wouldn't that uh, amount to using the whole of the work, uh, the, you know, the third factor, the amount and substantiality. So they are not using uh, a part of the video, they are using the whole video to give a reaction. Uh, is there anybody else who thinks that uh, uh, does a reaction video can claim the defense of fair use? Uh, maybe... Um, uh, I would like to uh, share their views. You can unmute your uh, uh, your device and please speak up. Sorry? Participants are also requested to raise questions if they have, if any, by virtue of either unmuting your call or uh, by keying in a message in the chat box. Uh, 
I think we. Uh, yes, anyone? Hey, uh, this is Vignesh, um, a student of Aramal College of Law. Uh, thank you for the session. It was very helpful. Uh, going back to your question, I think, yeah, they can take the defense of fair use in the reaction video case because unless and until they go through each and every second of the video and then play the whole video and then, you know, give their comment, maybe that, because you also mentioned about the quality of the content, right? How much of the quality content has been infringed? So I think that would be taken into consideration. But if they are randomly taking, uh, you know, some images, photographs out of it, and then just criticizing that, uh, maybe I think they can take the defense of fair use under the, uh, you know, Section 52, like parody, criticism, and review. Otherwise, we won't be able to do that at all, right, if that is stopped. So I right. think they may be able to take the defense of fair use. Right. So, uh, so all Next of you are... Yeah? No, no, no. Next, we have a question by Akash. Okay. Akash, could you yeah, please? Yeah. Yeah, th thank you, Manav. Uh, Weber, my question to you is, uh, mm -hmm. now there is something known as uh, mischief under law. Right. All right. right. Let's say to defeat the purpose of, uh, you know, attracting prosecution and uh, for a fair use. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So can I can I say that just in order to play mischief under the law, let's say I take a 30 minute video in the background and I give my criticism, which is only, let's say, which lasts only about 30 seconds. So, uh, can I use this sort of a uh, scenario or a situation to play mischief of the law and to come under the garb of uh, this criticism as contemplated under 52? So, uh, when you are using say 30 seconds of the three-minute video you said, so what what what's going to happen is uh, the courts are always going to look at they are they are going to evaluate it on a factor by factor basis. So, uh, in the purpose character and the nature of your use. The court is first going to look at the purpose of the use. So say you have used the 30 seconds of the video uh, and you used it and you post it, posted it online and you are making money out of it. So what is going to happen is uh, the court is going to find that the purpose of your use was commercial. So they will see that uh, even though you say supposedly you are not making money out of it, but it is still on YouTube and you are garnering a lot of uh, viewers and subscribers. So the court is going to look at the intention. There is a fifth factor, which is an implied factor. It's called as the good or bad factor. Uh, in this factor, the courts look at the intention of popping. So uh, it, it's it's an implied factor. It's not specifically mentioned. But uh, whenever such kind of a case comes in, uh, where the courts feel that the intention of the person was to uh, was to create a mischief, or you know maybe defame the person or monetize on other person's work, then they are going to uh, consider it as unfair, and that they are not going to let you get away uh, claiming the defense of fair use. So, uh, did, uh, would you ask this question? Because uh, I wanted to mention about the fifth factor, this good or bad factor, and there are a few cases that have happened in the U.S. Uh, where the courts, uh, after evaluating the first four factors, they still considered the motive of the person. So yeah, uh, definitely. In, uh, maybe in the Indian law, you might uh, not be liable for corporate infringement because uh, if it's not mentioned in the statute, then you are uh, not going to get the defense. And if you are, go if, if, if it's mentioned in the statute and your act falls within one of them, then you are going to get the defense. That's the problem. That fair dealing doctrine is very rigid. So supposedly your intention is good or bad, but. Uh, the act is falling within one of those 40 actions, then you are going to get the uh, defense of fair dealing. So that's why it's still in the nascent stage. All right. Thank you so much, Weber. Uh, we have another hey, uh, question by uh, Ms. Bapad. Uh, she has answered your question firstly. Uh, if the purpose is for entertainment and not to infringe the right, then it may take the defense case for you. And uh, she would ask you to recall the first case that you have mentioned for the purpose of fair use, if it is not too much of a trouble. So the first case was of Leibovitz versus Paramount Corp. Okay. Uh, there, you know, there was an actress, uh, there is an actress, Demi Moore. So what happened is there was a photographer and he had a photo shoot with her when she was eight months pregnant. Uh, back in 1993, uh, Paramount Corp 
uh, they had a film that was supposed to release in 1994 so what they did is uh, they took demi moore's photo and put leslie nelson another actor uh, and they put his face on her body and they released it for advertisement so what happened is uh, when the suit for infringement was filed the court said that even though it was used in an uh, it is even though it was used for advertisement the use was non commercial so by releasing that photo uh, with uh, leslie's face on it they were not making any money out of it and also at the same time they they were not competing with demi moore they were not harming her potential markets to gain money out of that particular photo it was a pure case of parody where they just wanted to mock demi moore for the photo that she had given so that's why the court said that this is not a case of copyright infringement it's a it's a case of fair use and that's why they let paramount get away with the uh, they, they did not make them liable for any kind of infringement to answer your uh, question silesh has also made a addition stating that copyright disclaimer under section 107 of the copyright act 1976 allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism comment news reporting scholarship and research fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing non profit educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use but then again the list is uh, not exhaustive it's not restrictive Okay. They have specifically put the words such as, and their their main intention was that uh, every case has its own facts and circumstances, and every case has a use that might amount to fair. Use. So okay. it's only up to the courts to de decide whether uh, it is a fair use or not. So that's why uh, we don't have the words such as. We have purposes of. So there is no no mentioning of the words such as. That's why R is a closed ended uh, doctrine. And they are the uh, fair use is more of an open-ended talk. Uh, Silesh, you can unmute your call and raise your question, please. Sir, good evening, and it's, uh, I'm very privileged to have you here, and it's very delightful and wonderful and knowledgeable experience you're sharing with us. Silesh, voice is not. Can you can you speak a little louder? Okay. Sir, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Okay, sir, I have a YouTube and a Facebook channel called Two Minutes Escape. so i also a influencer and creator of a video so sometimes i put my guitar videos with background music so in the last time what i had experience is that i put a video of uh, perfect at sharan where the youtube have blocked my channel there okay. regarding this copyright issues because so they are, what did i do is i just lower the tempo of like a uh, tune of that music and they did allowed it but it was the same thing so my question comes in here it is for the personal purpose and for the entertainment purpose still i came in the copyright issue why so so uh, you must have received a take down notice from youtube uh, uh, regarding your video uh, if i'm uh, uh, yes sir rajesh yeah. yes sir so uh, what youtube the procedure on youtube is uh, what happens is when supposedly you have posted a video and i think that your video is infringing so what i'll do is i'll report it to youtube and youtube without even giving you a chance is going to first now what you have to do is you have to file a counter so in your counter notification you are going to mention uh, that okay my use is for the purpose if it is a fair use i'm using it for my own purpose and i am not doing it to make money out of it it's for my own private purpose and also because the volume uh, is lowered down you can claim the uh, defense of de minimis uh, as you remember i had mentioned de minimis which is trivial so you can say that the copying of the work is so trivial that it should not amount to any kind of copyright infringement youtube uh, because they get millions of take down notices every day because there are so many people who think that that work is being infringed that uh, the procedure is usually to take down the video directly and then give them a chance to counter sue and give their explanation so that's that's what's probably happening with you and you should mention in your uh, counter sue that okay uh, my use is a fair use and you should also list down the section because uh, youtube uh, the person the people who uh, who who take down videos they are not very 
well qualified and they are not very uh, very much in touch with the law so you should mention that okay this is a fair use defense under section 107 of the copyright act and whatever i'm doing it's for my own private purpose it's it's a non commercial use so that's why i should be uh, my video should be uh, allowed to be published on youtube so i hope this uh, answers your question thank you very much sir thank you very much next we have another question from akash could you please unmute your call and raise your question uh yeah webber my uh, i just thought of this in fact uh so in this situation uh, i are you aware of nixi the national internet exchange of india uh i mean uh, so what exactly can be the I, i'm sorry your, your voice was uh, breaking i'm not very well aware of uh, nixi yeah so uh, uh, can you tell me if uh, in this situation i mean copyright cases usually uh, it goes to a civil court uh, can we also invoke in any way the jurisdiction of nixi considering that it's a uh, less complicated procedure it's main it mainly revolves around arbitration so uh, can there be some interplay of nixi in this uh, situation of 52 uh, section 52 yeah to be honest i'm not very well uh, in touch with nixi i don't i've not read the law but uh, what i feel is you consider any case in fair use or fair dealing okay consider any case every case has its own merits and demerits every case requires some kind of evaluation so if there if the nature of the case is such that uh, there the, uh, you should invoke uh, nixi or you should include uh, the jurisdiction of nixi then it should be done however what uh, because the doctrine of fair dealing is mentioned under section 52 uh, and i am not uh, i'm not sure if it's mentioned under nixi uh, if the claim of fair, de- fair dealing is used then compulsorily they have to go by the book so they have to use the US, uh, indian copyright act if nixi nixi specifically mentions the doctrine of fair dealing then they, there, there can be a case where they can include that manav you are you are uh, you are muted uh, yes uh, next we have a question by keerthi you may please unmute your call and raise your question so uh, the first case that you landmark case of us that you explain of the photo shoot paramount so so what i understand is that that american court focused more on whether the owner uh what suffered any harm or not so so my doubt is where if the case was brought before as in if it was an indian case then would the court look at whether harm has been done to the owner or would it look at whether even if there's no harm yet if the person infringing is uh, profiting out of it that should be more fo- more of the focus of the court right the court is always going to evaluate factor by factor okay and in this case they will always first lo- they looked at uh, the photographer so libovich the libovich was the photographer who took the photo of demi moore so technically it is his copyright so whenever a person takes a photo uh, the copyright is claimed it is owned by the person who takes the photo so in this case uh, the court first looked at the market harm so when paramount published the uh, the photo edited uh, image of leslie nelson they were not trying to compete with libovich neither they were trying to harm the reputation of demi moore all they were trying to do is mock them so uh, if they were if they had released the photo in the same market or maybe they have they would have displayed it in an art gallery and sold the photo for some money then that, that then that would be a problem so they always First, consider the market harm test in the U.S. because that is the most important factor among all the four of them. And in this case, Paramount did it only as a promotional activity. They they were not trying to make money out of it. So because Naked Gun is kind of a spoof movie, uh, they wanted to mock Demi Moore. So that's why uh, the court said that it's it's parody and there is no harm to the photographer and Demi Moore both of them. So that's why they did not make them liable for copyright infringement. the court is always going to evaluate factor by factor so it is not going to uh, so whenever they, there is a case the court first sees all the four factors and amongst those four factors the first thing they consider is market harm so if they find that there is no market harm because most of these infringement suits are only about money 
that uh, the copyright owner always claims that I have lost uh, some kind of money because of this copying and all. So if they find that this is not happening, then they are going to uh, award the defense of failure. Uh, we have a query regarding, in case you can share your email ID for the purpose of further queries. Sure. Are there any other queries on today's webinar? Yes, oh. I have seen the uh, email ID. Yes, Kirti, you may please uh, raise your question. So one last question, if you may. So, so in Indian Copyright Act, there is also a provision that uh, has intent as a defense, which is surprising because that is of criminal jurisprudence. So, so uh, my question is whether the American court also has um, such a such an outlook towards whether if the infringing person did not have an intent to infringe, would that be considered by the American? Because in India also, would that be considered even though it's in the act? No, I, I, I personally think that uh, Indian, when, whenever a, a case comes to the Indian court, they just go by the statute. It's a very rigid option. So uh, the fifth factor that I mentioned, the good or bad factor, it's it's for the fair use doctrine. So in the US, there have been such cases where they considered the intent of the person. So whether it was uh, it, it was done in a good faith or bad faith. In India, it's purely by the book. If it's mentioned, then okay. If it's not mentioned, then you are not going to be awarded. That's why they, in, in the case of India TV, uh, what says Yashraj, their intent was not to make, uh, uh, their intent was not to make uh, money out of uh, yeah, Yashraj's video. They were trying to do a news reporting or a broadcast of the show where they were trying to display the lives of singers. So what the courts felt that although the intent was done in, uh, there was good faith, the intention was to do to be done in good faith, but it was not uh, falling within the purview of section 52. So they, although they said that your dealing was fair, we are still going to consider this that uh, as, a, as unfair because it's not enumerated in section 50. So they what they did is because they knew that the intent was done, it was done in good faith, they let them go. They said that the restrictions that are imposed on you, we are we are setting it aside. However, you are not you are not going to be able to broadcast the show. So that's the thing. Uh, they are always going to they are trying to develop. They are trying to evolve. They are uh, trying to consider if. Uh, section 52 can be made broad enough to, you know, include such factors like intent and all. But as of now, I think that they are going by the book and it's, uh, it's more of a restrictive list. So I hope that answers your question. Next we have uh, Aishwarya V. Do you have any query to be raised? Yes, Aishwarya, is there any query from your end? Okay. Okay, so... That, on that note, I would like to thank uh, Vaibha Vora for taking uh, time out of his schedule uh, to be present on today's webinar and he gave a very detailed webinar uh, for more than an hour. And I also would like to thank all the participants uh, for their patience. And the reason that I see... Uh, few number of questions from from the participants is because the amount of clarity that our speaker had uh, given us to the subject so i'm deeply grateful to you Weber, for uh, coming and sharing your views on the subject today thanks a lot manu uh, and uh, i'm also grateful to our uh, participant mr anjania who's uh, live streaming this webinar on YouTube. I shall be sharing a link to all of your post today's session. Thank you and uh, have a nice day all of you. Thank you everybody. Have a good one.